I was I was invited. I was invited tonight because many many years ago, I called Dave Zirin the best young sports writer in America. I accepted this invitation so that I could retract the quote. <laughs> In the intervening years since I made that rash judgment, might be two, three, yeah. uh, I think Dave's combination of sustained outrage, similes gone wild, <laughs> <laughs> love of the games, and a clear sense of right and wrong has made him simply the best sports writer in America, regardless of age. Dave, Dave is not only phenomenal, he is unique. Week after week, Edge of Sports, the column which you all read avidly, delivers a perspective on our national bliss outs that you cannot find anywhere else. His new book, People's History of Sports in the United States, uh, I think is the assigned text now to those supercharged weekly lessons. Uh, if you're a fan of Captain Z, you have to read the book. If you're not, you will become one. And calling Dave a sports writer may be misleading. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm seriously not sure if he's a sports writer who makes the connections to our everyday social and political lives, or a political writer who uses sports as a prism to understand the values of America today. For the next, until he gets bored or hits me, we're going to talk about that. And then we're going to open it up and to your much better questions. But there is one burning question facing the Republic today that we really have to clear up first that only Dave Zirin can tell us. Do you think there is any significance to the fact that Bristol Palin's, <laughs> why is that funny? That Bristol Palin's uh, baby daddy is an ice hockey player. You know, Bob, I've been waiting for someone to ask that question. <laughs> and just first of all, the fact that her name is Bristol Palin, she's not exactly named after the headquarters of ESPN in Bristol, Connecticut, although some people are saying that she was. But I'll tell you this, I could go the rest of my life and die with a big old smile on my face if I never hear the words Bristol Palin again. So that's, that's kind of where I stand on that. Mm -hmm. I knew you wouldn't be able to help us much. No. But I would like to say thanks to everybody for coming here tonight and resisting the siren call of watching the Republican National <laughs> Thank you so much. And just, I'm sorry, I know- No, no, if you talk a little fast, we'll be able to get out in time to see it. That's good. <laughs> Thank you. And I, as someone who went to college in the Twin Cities, McAllister College in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and I know there's some McAllister people here tonight, that's when you're supposed to go, yeah. Or not. Um, see, see, that shows you know they went to a Minnesota college. They're quiet and polite in this context. But, I mean, honestly, like seeing the Republican National Convention in the Twin Cities would be sort of like if the Red Sox won the World Series and did a victory parade in Times Square. Like it's such an inappropriate place for them to be, especially considering that's where the bridge collapsed last year because Governor Tim Pawlenty would not fund the bridge. And I'm not just doing this as an ad hominem attack on the Republicans, although that's always fun. I'm saying it because it actually is connected to sports. Because while Tim Pawlenty chronically underfunded the bridge, he pushed through over the objections of the people of Minnesota uh, a tax for a $500 million stadium for the Minnesota Twins. Uh, and their owner, Carl Polat, who's the richest owner in Major League Baseball. So I didn't want to just put that out there as forcefully as possible. Money for bridges, not stadiums. It doesn't sound that radical, but for some reason, it hasn't gotten through the heads of the Republican Party. Well, speaking of stadiums, I, I love that image you had that um, the wonderful thing about Hurricane Katrina was that all those people that 
couldn't afford to pay their way into the Superdome got in for free. That's right. That's right. And they were also the people who paid for the stadium in the first place. I mean, and the Superdome was really ahead of its time in the mid-1970s because that was one of the first grand publicly funded stadiums. And for decades, it was the largest dome structure in the world. And they threw a tax down on people to put that stadium to fruition and then made the prices so high that the people who paid for it could never get in. So there was like a cruel, bitter, not even Tom Wolf would dare irony, you know, to actually creating a situation where there weren't any emergency shelters, there was an emergency evacuation, but you had this publicly funded monstrosity that was effectively uh, unusable as even shelter within a few short hours. Well, why do, why do we keep rolling over for this? For what in particular? For the stadium? For the stadiums. I mean, you know that these people are, are groaning in New York about the, uh, the personal license, the seat licensing fees, you know, 20 grand for really good giant tickets. They're going to pay it. I should ask, but can people hear okay? I can.